Hey, everybody. Welcome back to your full crew podcast. I'm Dawn Soldai, one of your co-hosts. And I'm Mike Peel, your other co-host. Uh, we've got a great show for you today. I want to thank our sponsors, Rupert Law, SAIC, Drone Up, and Fixar for making it possible. We're going to be talking about some amazing articles today, uh, starting off with measuring the planet's heartbeat with fiber optics, uh, which is, I mean, those words together are just interesting <laughs> in their own right, right? We're also going to be talking about the near space race, which is uh, basically the technology race that's happening in low Earth orbit and lower. Uh, and uh, that should be very interesting. Also, we're also uh, at the end of the episode. So stay tuned for it. For our drone people, we're going to have an update on the FAA UAM CONOPS 2.0. And somewhere in the middle of that, we're going to be talking about the uh, GitHub lawsuit and what's happening there. Um, we've got some great people to talk about these topics today, including Lindsay. Lindsay, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Mike. My name is Lindsay Moreoverlan. I'm a principal geomechanic consultant with a company called Rockenge. And uh, my background is I'm a Canadian mining engineer, so I'm very interested in geosciences, geo-earth sciences. And uh, I'm excited to talk about monitoring that's super important for um, understanding more about our Earth. Well, super excited to have you. And then we also have uh, long-term friends of uh, Dawn, P3 Tech, and myself, uh, Mary Caitlin. So Mary Caitlin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Mike. I'm Mary Caitlin Ray. I'm a counsel in the a law office of Kroll and Mooring LLP in Washington, DC. Um, prior to joining Kroll, I was an attorney in the FAI office of the chief counsel. In my practice, I focus on the legal implications of emerging technologies in the aviation space, specifically drones, eVTOLs, and now more increasingly commercial space and near space issues. So I'm excited to talk about this new frontier on the podcast today. Awesome. And uh, thank you for joining us. We're going to head on over to our first article. So um, we've got some great dense articles to talk about today. Lindsay, you want to tell us about your article and why you chose it? Yeah, sure. So the first, the article that I selected was about um, fiber optics and using fiber optic technology to monitor underground or like difficult to get data from. And the reason I selected this article is, as I mentioned, I'm a mining engineer and I do lots of design work for underground. And really important for that is stability. We have underground miners and people who go underground. And in those designs, I need to make sure they stay stable and safe. In the article, it talks about that we have tremors underground, we have volcanic activity, there's all kinds of things that happen. The earth is constantly evolving and moving. So that impacts designs that I do in my everyday professional life. And often I need to have a way to monitor and figure out what's going on underground. We have, it's very typical to have seismic monitoring and they talk about it in the article too, where it's a single point where we can collect data from a single point. And that gets you, you know, a little bit of the story, but an opportunity to collect data over miles along a single line is so much more rich to get a better understanding of exactly what's happening, how things are moving underground, how the stresses or pressures are changing underground. So the article talks a lot about its implications for, you know, in the civil world from say earthquakes or volcanoes, but I wanna talk about it in a mining perspective it wasn't particularly mentioned in the article, but in my everyday life, I'm constantly collecting data and finding a better uh, way to get more improved data to improve our designs. So I thought that article, I was like, is there a way we can take that fiber optic technology and apply it to our underground mining to make it safer and have improved designs? Yeah, it seem, certainly seems like a, a, a new um, level of resolution of data that you could get and, and feedback and insights. Uh, Mary Caitlin, what are your thoughts? This is really an interesting read for me, um, admittedly, a kind of a, a new material and a new area. Um, and I, so I was thinking, you know, you mentioned, Lindsay, the, the mining um, and the safety uses of this kinds of uh, kind of technology. Do you see that there are do you see that there's a broader opportunity to use it, for example, in like in urban planning or, um, you know, other types of settings where it could increase the um, safety in those types of spaces? 
I think there is. Like I know for civil applications, we're doing tunnels, right? We do tunnels for highways, for all kinds of rail transportation, and they need to have a certain factor of safety. So they're designed to have a certain amount of capacity to support a particular amount of load. But the load in the ground, underground, can change because the ground is continually changing. We need to be able to monitor that. And if we can put in some of this fiber optic technology anywhere we have any kind of underground excavation, it definitely gives you that next level of safety because you're constantly monitoring along a full line as opposed to a single point. So I think there's applications for urban settings specifically in an underground area. And lots of those big cities now have subway systems, tunnels, all this underground infrastructure. I think also where we have dams, hydroelectric dams, any of that kind of um, infrastructure could also benefit from this kind of sensing technology. Interesting. That kind of reminds me, yeah, of, I mean, you know, one of the applicate for initial applications people talked about for um, small UAS, you know, the three Ds, right, Don and Mike, the, the dull, dirty, dangerous um, jobs that, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, integration of drones was intended to, you know, improve um, improve the safety of performing those kinds of tasks. This kind of reminds me of, of that framework. I think that's a great point. I just wanted to touch on it because drones and using underground LIDAR, that's something we always want to try and do too. But the, the 3Ds, I think you called it, are very challenging underground. It's extremely dark. It's extremely dusty. We send a drone in and they need to be able, They um, it seems like they have to have line of sight to be able to operate the ones that mm -hmm. I've seen underground. So we can't capture the data we need. Whereas this fiber optic, if I drill a uh, a hole as long as I can get, I don't know, half a mile or maybe I can get a mile and put that fiber optic, I can collect data throughout that entire zone, which I can I can't get a drone into. Through the rock, it's extremely hard to get data because you can't there's no actual space to put anything into. So I want to measure waveforms that are traveling underground through the rock. And this seems like an excellent type of technology to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Especially uh, just even going back to the urban planning thing, one of the things that you're seeing is cities that are taught in geography class um, ever since, I think, 2004. So basically, as the Internet starts to grow, more pictures of those places become available. They're seeing a giant influx of populations from rural areas. And this is true the whole world around. So if it's one thing to build up, but mm -hmm. even if you're building up, you need to know what's going on underground, but you also need to be able to plan underground transportation mm -hmm. um, for all of those new citizens in those places. So mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of exciting that you, you have a new tool at your disposal now, especially uh, for what seems like we're are, are nearly unreachable areas um, at current. Uh, Dom, what, what yeah, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about this technology because like Mary Caitlin said, this was kind of a, a new thing for me as I read it. Um, they're calling this distributed acoustic sensing or DAS, and it's like radar, but with light. And, um, you know, as Lindsay said, it's, it's really better technology instead of like an expensive, hard to maintain seismic monitor that would only give you one point of information at one single location. This, this can be so, you know, the, this cape, fiber optic cable can be super long and provide information all along. The example they gave was, and by the way, at like one meter resolution, they can turn a 10 kilometer fiber into something like the equivalent of 10,000 sensors. I mean, think about mm -hmm. that for a minute. So, mm -hmm. I mean, just really exponentially, you know, kind of providing data in, in a way that was really unprecedented before this. And it's, you know, these scientists, I think that figured this out were, I thought it was funny. They, they kind of used uh, a cable that was, cause these cables are not new. Right. Uh, and what they were using was, was to monitor um, underground or underwater, you know, mar marine animal activity. And there was uh, a cable that was like, in maintenance and some of these scientists came in and said, Hey, while, while this thing is down, let's try something. And, and, you know, what they found out was like, they they found a whole new area, uh, like of the San Andreas fault line underwater, which mm -hmm. I mean, super significant, right? So to be able mm -hmm. to, you know, think from a safety standpoint, 
detect like in advance, give it, give advanced information about when a tsunami might be hitting, you know, um, and, and save people's lives. I mean, I just think this is really incredible. And Lindsay, I, I'm not smart enough to understand fully the, how this technology works with the beam of light coming out of the fiber optic cables, but, um, it obviously works and, and they're deploying it not only in maritime environments, but like you said, through rocks and also underneath ice. So the story really in the pictures in, in that image Mike showed earlier were from Iceland and uh, some of these ice, um, you know, uh, formations and the seismic activity that's occurring underneath them. That's what they're measuring there and, and talk about a really rough environment. So um, just, just really, I think, incredible technology that I'd never heard of before. So thanks for sharing this with us. Mm -hmm. uh, here's here's a quick uh, question. Does this analogy work? It's kind of like a sonogram, but with light. Um, I'm sh not sure if I know what a sonogram is, but I, I want to pick up waves. Like we have waves that travel through medium. When I think of data collection, if it's in the air, you can use LIDAR. You're looking at I, like you're sending points across and picking up their reflection, I believe, right? Yeah. But you can't do that when you're underwater as well. And definitely not when you're underground in the rock mass. So this is an opportunity where we can send waveforms or sometimes the ground automatically generates these waveforms because of tectonic movement. And you can pick it up on these fiber optics. The, the technology is that you have light traveling through that fiber optic, right? But if there's any disturbance in the in the rock, because that fiber ah. that fiber optic is um, coupled, it's, so it's coupled to the yeah. rock mass. It's all grouted in place. So if there's any movement, the reflection of the light deviates. It changes. So that's how it says, "Oh, we've got a waveform. We've got a disturbance," and that's how it picks up any changes in the ground. That's that's kind of brilliant, right? <laughs> Actually, wow. Yeah. And it does and it at every like point along a full kilometer so the resolution that you can get over that is amazing i think the challenge with the technology now is okay great that is a huge amount of data how am i going to make that right. useful into my designs so because it can tell me where the displacement happened in the rock mass and then there's everything in between and if i can get strain in the rock mass like any deformation how big that is to feed that back but the amount of data coming in all the time must be huge because there's so many like measurement points now so do we have the computing technology or capabilities to manage all that data coming in yeah in some ways uh because uh it's it's a wire that light is traveling through so it, it's continuous you could actually um split that up into as many points as you want mm -hmm. right so you're deciding where the fixed points mm -hmm. are um but then in terms of the data load you're right it, and actually you're probably not it's going to be a couple years worth of testing mm -hmm. that that takes to figure out what is actually insightful and is a sensible use of compute power versus what are we just brute forcing and just wasting energy mm -hmm. on um so these are things to i guess pay attention to but if we look back on drones for, you know, eight, 10 years ago, what was uh, available for 3D mapping was pretty rough. And today we have things like NERFs and the resolution is absolutely phenomenal. I don't know if anybody's seen the backyard fly through, but um, between um, a point cloud, some image capture and some AI uh, finagling afterwards, it looked like a literal walkthrough of a house with the drone, but it was actually just pictures that had been taken. So that's the level of that we've gotten to in a couple of years there. Now let's apply that to the whole earth. So this is really exciting. We're gonna move on to the next article. Thank you for bringing this up, Lindsay. Um, so another interesting field that seems like we're bringing more resolution to our world. Um, so Chinese balloon saga could be part of a new space race closer to Earth or the near space race. So Mary Caitlin, why did you select this article and what do you think was important about it? I selected this article um, because, frankly, it was a, a kind of a new look at this issue, you know, related to um, a the use of, of Chinese technology and Ch Chinese aviation technology specifically, as well as, you know, kind of the regulation of new and emerging spaces within the aviation field. Um, this article focused kind of on more the military aspects of, you know, how um, how the use of this type of technology is driving our 
relations with China. Um, I typically live in the more civil and commercial space and, you know, looking at FAA regulations and DOT regulations um, and even DOD regulations regarding, you know, the use of foreign technologies um, and things of that nature. So I, I was drawn to this article because it was a, a new lens on that, on sort of the same issue that I've been looking at over the last few years. Um, I also think it's really interesting to look at gray areas as, as an attorney, that's kind of where I live. That's where I spend a lot of my time. Um, but I find near space to be a gray area, just, you know, physically, right? Where is it? Um, where does it start? Where does it end? How does it interact with other types of airspace? And also from a regulatory standpoint, um, you know, we certainly have some precedent from the FAI in terms of how they might handle operations in near space. Um, and we're starting, you know, we know from a, a DOD standpoint how that um, airspace is being used as well, but this is in no way well settled. Um, I think that there's still a lot of questions out there, um, you know, bet between the, you know, multiple different kinds of aircraft that could be present in this space, right? You have free, um, balloons, you have moored balloons, unmanned balloons, there's talk of sending um, stratospheric balloons into space with passengers for, you know, commercial operations. Um, so it's definitely a new frontier. And this article, I thought, you know, looked at the implications of this opening new frontier and how it's affecting our relations with China, which, you know, has been an ongoing issue um, in the, the um, aerospace and defense space, um, you know, in the more recent past, we've had a lot of debates on the use of Chinese technology um, on you know, drones to include you know, parts and components under not just DOD contracts, but there's been you know, significant debate on the use of that type of technology on state and local government contracts, other federal agency contracts. Um, so I really see this issue um, as an extension of, of that and, and part of that discussion. Yeah, yeah, certainly. We're we're not in the uh, the world of 2010, <laughs> or even the International Space Station, what it was a couple of years ago. So uh, geopolitics do play into uh, things a lot more today. Lindsay, what are your what are your thoughts on the article? Yeah, so in the article, I guess because I don't work in that field too often, I had lots of questions. I like Mary Caitlin mentioned near space. I'm like, what exactly defines near space? You're right. There is this layer on the outer surface before we get to outer space, but how do you decide where near space actually is? There's that actual footage mark, but is there something else different about that? And then from the governance or regulatory perspective, um, I recognize there are there are regulations and compliance, you know, for our commercial airspace area. And then I'm like, got me thinking, I never thought of it before. Are there those same regulations when you talk about that near space, right? Or is that where we're missing right now? So can anybody just put a balloon up into there or what are the rules around that right now? Well, I, you know, from, from an FAA perspective, uh, you know, there's certainly um, regulations of, of putting anything, pretty much anything up into the air, right? And the FAA is expanding its, its claim of jurisdiction over really anything considered the navigable airspace. And, you know, because technology continues to evolve, not only in the near space space, but also in the, the unmanned aircraft space, what is now navigable is much broader than what was navigable, you know, even in the recent past. So we now have uh, products that are considered aircraft that can navigate down, you know, to the blades of grass. And so, mm. you know, the FAI has been asserting its jurisdiction from the blades of grass upwards. Um, I think that near space is typically thought of as th that part of the airspace that's um, between 60,000 up to like 300,000 or so feet above ground level. Um, so it's, I, I believe, you know, you have certain, certain fixed wing aircraft that can operate at that, that um, altitude. So it's mm -hmm. not outer space yet. Um, but, you know, there are certainly FAA regulations that regulate, you know, weather balloons, moored balloons, um, a plethora of, of aircraft that are, that take the form of balloons that are um, designed to function in this space. Um, they have, you know, there's a separate part of the FAA regulations. It's typically part 101, I believe, that, that addresses um, balloon operations. And, and a lot of those are, um, you know, weather balloons or other data gathering balloons, not unlike the one that, you know, we all saw, I think it was February 4th, that 
was determined to be a Chinese balloon that was making its way across the U.S. So I think, you know, before that hit the headlines and was was on the news cycle 24-7, a lot of people hadn't given a lot of thought to near space and um, and stratospheric balloons. But here we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, <clears throat> so, you know, class A airspace ends at uh, 60,000 feet. So, you know, I, I, this is a really interesting regulatory area I'd love to get into. In fact, next year, Mary Caitlin Ray, um, at our Law Tech Connect, I'm absolutely having a space panel because I know I don't think people realize how connected, number one, everything is to space, right? Our GPS satellites are up there in low Earth or orbit. So um, what I thought was really interesting about this, well, number one, I, you know, I've got a military background, so this was right up my alley, but uh, I thought there were just so many interesting nuggets in here. You know, this the fact that there's this commercial military fusion in China that the the two guys making these balloons for China, right, are now part of the government. Shocking. Um, and, you know, they started this 2018 Chinese Hongu. Well, yeah, I think that's how you pronounce it. H-O-N-G-H-U program, which I guess means swan focusing on near space technologies and these particular balloons. Uh, the other thing I found really interesting, and I'm channeling Don Bershaw from True Weather Solutions right now, this is all about weather monitoring in, in some respects. So there's a surveillance aspect. Absolutely. You can collect data about what's happening on the ground. You know, like what are, what are those military people doing at those bases down there? But, but the connection I had never made, which is really interesting and makes a lot of sense, is this connection to collecting weather data there. Why? Because between 60,000 feet and this um, uh, th 330,000 feet uh, before you hit outer space corridor, let's call it, that's where the hypersonic missiles are going to go. And, mm -hmm. and you need to know what the weather is going to be there So because that will impact the flights of those missiles. So the connection to hypersonics is one that I never made until I read this article. And I find it to be actually quite frightening. Um, that they've been doing this for years and building this program and not only spying on the ground, but also collecting lots of weather data that possibly nobody else has at this point um, to assist their hypersonic missile program. Right, Nick? Well, Don, I don't know if you read uh, a little deeper into the source that was cited um, in the article, but uh, I did and I, I had to translate because it was in Chinese. So uh, there might be some details that were wrong. Uh, including the name of the article, uh, it said "Satellite God Power." So, <laughs> um, so, so I'm sure that is a mistranslation. But the the part that they quoted, uh, that NPR quoted, uh, did translate exactly. Um, and the one of the things that I thought was interesting was the genesis of this perspective, according to uh, this Chinese government statement, was our 2005. Uh, reauthorization act um, talking specifically about UAS <laughs> technology um, so what uh, the strategy was basically looking at what's an opening where we can develop affordable technology and still gain ground on uh, whatever the United States mission is in this space um, so they are thinking of it in terms of uh, a defensive action um, so that's that's one thing that I thought was interesting. The other thing I want to bring up that uh, on the commercial side that I think is interesting, like uh, especially since Mary Caitlin brought up like this being a sort of gray zone, um, I think about technologies that were proposed out of like alphabets, um, you know, X projects or moonshots like uh, Google Loon, which was the idea of sending balloons into um, the same exact area of the sky. Uh, which was to provide internet services. So not just research. So we're, we've discussed research and we've discussed military and defense applications, but also commercial applications. When is that okay to do that over somebody else's country? Like, for example, provide internet services to a country that shut them down because they don't want people communicating if it's an authoritative state. So I think there's a lot of kind of uh, intermingling across all these lines that's going to happen now that this technology is making it readily available to traverse this area um, between space and sky. 
uh, that we didn't have before. Absolutely. Any other comments to that? <laughs> I think we're good. All right, I guess we're moving on to the next one. Deep thoughts with Mike. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mike, since we're kind of at that midpoint, did you want to do our little thank you to our sponsors? Yes, I do want to thank uh, Rubric, Law, Rubric Law, SAIC, uh, Fixar, and Jonup for sponsoring the show and making this all possible. Again, I want to thank the audience for participating. Uh, so Jason Sewer, great discussion. Thank you, Jason. Jason, And uh, nice to see you again. So I think we saw him on Donna Jones last week or the week before. So um, thank you for tuning in as always. Moving on to the next piece. So um, actually, I'm going to be asking a lot of questions. So supposedly, there's been progress on the uh, GitHub um, lawsuit. For those of you who don't remember what this was about, essentially, um, people uh, who produce code often post it publicly on GitHub. Uh, it has a um, open source license, but that does not mean necessarily that you can use that work without attribution. Um, and it also does not mean that you have full license to do with it whatever you want. But GitHub as a company uh, decided to uh, do data analysis on all of the code on their network using AI to produce a tool called GitHub Copilot, which I like to use. So. <laughs> The outcome of this lawsuit is very significant for me. Um, but those coders felt like their work was being used inappropriately and outside of the, the way that the license had described. So they have now sued uh, GitHub uh, and its parent company, Microsoft, and also uh, the contractor who did this work, which is OpenAI, which I believe also might be um, a giant partner with Microsoft now too. So. Things are moving forward on that. Um, so my questions actually pertain to uh, two aspects that the judge recently rejected. Um, so the defense tried to dis dismiss these motions. The plaintiffs claim that the codex's capacity to reproduce code represents a breach of software licensing terms. And also that uh, this is a violation of section 1202B of the Digi Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Act. If you've ever heard the term DMCA or DMCA takedown, that is the act that is in question. That Copilot and Codex reproduce copyrighted code without required copyright management information, author title, owner terms and conditions, and so on. Last time we brought this up, uh, even actually when we were first using ChatGPT live on this show, I said there seems to be an issue with attribution that I think is actually totally solvable with the technology itself, um, and they haven't done a good job of it yet. So. Um, I'm I'm looking for any insights into what this actually means, what these uh, these rejected uh, motions um, mean. Um, if anybody on the panel could help me, please step up. Well, okay. I, I mean, uh, so first of all, I'm Mary Caitlin and I were talking before the show. I mean, neither of us are IP attorneys. We're both attorneys. She's practicing. I'm not. Uh, although I still have my license uh, in good standing. Um, you know what what this is 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 just kind of a stage of the case where the defense, which is Microsoft GitHub and, and that crowd, is trying to basically just get rid of a bunch of the plaintiff's claims against them. Um, and the judge rejected, you know, significantly dismissed, you know, that aspect of their motion. So what that means is, in, in two respects, that means that the plaintiffs, the people suing Microsoft and GitHub um, are able then to proceed for sure on, on at least two aspects of their case, which is uh, that the code represents a breach of the software licensing terms and this D DMCA aspect, Mike, that you just mentioned, uh, that this attribution, attribution aspect, right? That this violates the DMCA because you're, you're grabbing people's code and you're not really giving them credit for it. And that violates uh, or so they say, a portion of, of the statute. So um, there's a whole slew of things that that the uh, plaintiffs or the people suing through at the companies and what the judge did with those, which was a semi win for Microsoft, but not really, uh, basically said, hey, look, there might be something here, but I'm going to send it back 
and let the plaintiffs again those suing kind of you know perfect those it. like explain a little bit more like in other words he didn't outright the judge didn't outright dismiss these he's given them a second bite of the apple to say is there any there there and and, and these uh, a lot like contract interference fraud false designation of origin unjust enrichment unfair competition breach of github's own privacy policy in terms of service and violation of the california consumer privacy act something we talked about uh last week at the law tech connect uh mary caitlin was on on that privacy panel with vic moss and kenji shugahara and, and some other amazing folks uh cam shell from dragonfly uh so the ccpa you know very broad uh provisions uh, about privacy and gives uh, companies and individuals a lot of different rights when it comes to their information. Uh, and the last one is negligence. And that's just a straight up, you had a duty, you breached it, you know, and, and there's damages here. There's, there's a causation and damage. So um, that's a lot. I mean, that's a lot to defend against if you're Microsoft and GitHub. Now, clearly they've got an army of attorneys, uh, but the folks on the other side of the fence are now honing these claims and the, you know they may very well survive. So they haven't been outright dismissed. They have that second bite of the apple. So I think from a um, you know kind of keep your eye on this standpoint, there's still a lot to be yeah, and, resolved. And these are the key claims, right? Yeah, these are the ones that have yeah. huge significance. And so imagine, this, yeah, the CCPA piece of this. Yeah, you know, people should be watching that carefully because when you think about code and you think about AI and this whole attribution issue and you know people's information and how that's going to play into the ccpa holy shnikes my brain is exploding mary right because yeah that's a lot oh. i mean and we'll see i think you know the next step we'll see what's going to be um included in the amended complaint but this seems at least this seems to me to be the real the first test of the legal boundaries of this type of technology um and if if it's successful it has the potential to put the brakes on you know further development of of this type of software i think yeah, or even uh, a use of it, right? So, for example, what we're doing here on YouTube, uh, you know, this is our IP. We've created it, right? And the current YouTube license understands it that way. But if YouTube was it then to sell a product where you create your own creator that's based off of the amalgamation of Dawn, I, Mary Caitlin, and, and Lindsay, uh, why wouldn't that be a violation of, our copyright. I mean, and those are the ways that this tool can be used. Basically, anything you do in public can be analyzed by an AI tool and reproduce a result that's at least analogous. So source and attribution, I think the outcome of this case across, across all lines, not just here in code, but probably with mid journey and stable diffusion. So the um, image generation ones, but e even ones that'll be able to provide data insights, like how are you able to do that? Where did that data come from? And do you have to rightly attribute it? Um, so I, I think this is probably the most significant case in AI and um, I, I hope it continues to be kind of uh, held up that way because I think it's gonna have repercussions for how this technology can be used. Um, I have a question, we'll if yeah. that's okay, from yeah. somebody who doesn't do too much AI work, but. I am involved in in generating code and we have it all very um, under proprietary, like it's all under our own um, area. So it's not shared. And I'm trying to understand why people would put their code they've generated themselves into say an open source environment. Maybe now, somebody I'm can help I'm smiling it. because oh, that's Mike. That. This is my, Mike yeah. works very closely with the Drone Code Foundation uh, and the open source group. So go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so open source is, uh, is important sometimes for industries to even be able to thrive. And um, in the drone space, uh, it's been kind of simple. There wasn't an established um, code base that could provide uh, all of the safety options, regulatory compliance uh, that would be necessary for the hardware. Um, so by creating kind of a baseline with the open source base that everybody shares into, you're raising the stability of the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Linux is a good example of that. And that's why you see Linux used in cloud servers today, or even in the menu at your local restaurant, that's more likely to be uh, Linux now than Windows. Why? Because when it breaks, it's not Microsoft saying, well, we wanted to do before our business purpose something else. So now you're screwed. 
you could rely on that minimum viable standard. Um, so it's it's really important to the evolution of uh, especially new tech spheres. The the other thing is just security. So when something's proprietary and nobody knows how it works because you built it, when it fails, now we're all at risk for it. So um, you know there's certain re requirements for disclosure and other avenues of life. Um, this is basically just like a community disclosure. This is what the security infrastructure looks like. Everybody can work to solve this problem. Everybody can try to do penetration testing on it to uh, try and uh, hack through it and show like, oh, well, we need to bug fix there. Or, And then there's also just the benefit um, that large communities of coders actually produce better results than small people working on a problem because it's, it's basically you'll pick out um, issues Mm -hmm. um that you would not occur to you and your internal team especially under the pressure of market forces so all of those are the reasons why open source exists and then for the individual coder a lot of it is portfolio building so much of this code is actually people that either uh are got out of school or or while they're in school produce this benefit to everybody out there in the public uh and they get a job out of it and then a lot of those people continue contributing because they saw the benefit of it to their life and and their ability to dip into the pool and borrow code uh, for whatever purpose they're using for is is available. But all of that is based on the understanding that you will be properly attributed. Mm -hmm. So if you do that, that that completely destroys that. And then people won't produce code that can be shared and used by all. It makes us less secure. And it also uh, can stall the evolution of an industry because it becomes little individual islands of work, just private corporations, mm -hmm. and that's all. So those are kind of the reasons why open source exists and has has thrived. Because um, it's, it's, it's about a, a 40 to 50 year old principle now. Um, and GitHub actually made it explode because it made it literally shareable from one end of the earth to the other, um, not just in a book somewhere in a library. Um, so this this is a core violation of the principle, what Microsoft did here with GitHub. Yeah, so Lindsay, I had the same question and I actually last year went to the PX4 Developer Summit and that's uh, part of the Drone Code Foundation. They put on this uh, uh, conference every year and it's, Mike, what's the larger event it's connected? It's like the open, the, the open source group the large oh well that was uh that's not always connected but yeah okay. linux foundation is is they were running uh co-located events at the same place so yeah the linux foundation yeah so all, this whole crowd was there lindsay and i learned so much just by walking the floor and uh i wrote an article for drone life sp specifically about uh the needs um or how the Drone Co Foundation and this open source is serving the drone community and security was one of that one of that's uh, those aspects. So I learned a lot at that and and everybody, if you uh, it, it's maybe one that you never put thought to put on your scope, but that conference, the PX4 Developers Conference, is going to be in New Orleans over a weekend this year, the weekend of October 22nd. So you want a fun weekend in New Orleans, and then you want to learn a lot and meet this open source crowd. Uh, I encourage you to to join uh, to to check that out and, and consider attending that event. Uh, I did for the first time last year. It was really educational for me. I learned a ton and uh, met some really great folks. And like I said, there's so many different ecosystems that touch uh, you know the drone world and the electric vertical takeoff landing, advanced air mobility crowd. And code coding is one of them. These are flying computers, right? And same with space. Uh, I just went to the space symposium a couple weeks ago. So it's been really fun to tap into these other groups that I have never historically been involved in because they're they're really all connected. Yeah, if you want to see w w technology ahead of of the curve in the drone space, like I always get an idea as I watch these uh, really, really masterfully intelligent people converse at this conference about what problems they're trying to solve. And those are the solutions you'll actually see a couple couple months out or a year out. So this is my my dirty secret and how I know what's going on in the drone space ahead of time. So anyway, uh, speaking of, of the drone space or just uh, uh, automating the skies uh, in general, the FAA's concept of operations version 2.0 for urban air mobility 
So we finally made it to 2.0. What does that mean, Don? You know, okay. So we made it to 2.0 and I'm shaking my head. So this came out at the end of April uh, with kind of very little fanfare, honestly. And maybe there's a good reason for that. Because as I read it, and it's about 42 pages long, including, you know, the the table of contents and the appendices and whatnot. Um, you know, I, I don't know that there's a lot of there there. there there's some terminology changing, but let, let's let's put it this way. 1.0 came out uh, in June of 2020. In that same exact year, uh, Europe, EASA, put out their use space regulation. I'm underlining the word regulation, okay? So let's talk about what a CONOPS is and what it isn't. Uh, and and this, this document is very clear about what it isn't. Uh, it's essentially a description of a future state of what they hope it will be. Um, this is really not... Um, prescriptive. It's it's uh, it's aspirational and it's dynamic, which means that hey, maybe there's going to be a 3.0 at some point. But what does this mean for the people that want to fly, quote unquote, air taxis or the electric vertical takeoff landing? Um, it gives them a little bit of an idea of what the future could look like. But it honestly, it's not regulation. It's not a notice of public rulemaking. It's it's not even certain like this will be the final version right like this is like hey we've been talking to a lot of people this keeps evolving so this is what it might look like and you know some of the new words that are, are thrown out here so for so people are in the know um you know this idea of a cooperative cooperative operating environment in the sky right so you'll have your uas traffic management that'll be the low altitude traffic management system that's not necessarily connected to air traffic control it's going to be very privatized that's going to control the drones that again does not exist yet that is also in its own con ops this extensible traffic management or xtm is what they're calling it it's going to complement traditional air traffic services or air traffic control and it's going to be part of this holistic environment for future passaging passenger or cargo carrying aircraft, okay? So that's what we're talking about here. They're talking about car doors quite a bit. So I want to underscore that because I, you know, Mary Caitlin alluded to this whole FAA controls down to the lowest blade of grass and that, that kind of federalism argument of, you know, where does the airspace begin and end when you're, you know, talking from a state perspective, uh, and, and people's private property or, or businesses, you know, here they're talking about car doors and, and they don't even say like exactly how high they'll be in my airspace, uh, and how, but there's definitely going to be transit areas, right? Because you got to get from the ground up to that car door, however high it is. And, um, you know, how that's all going to work. Uh, a couple major assumptions in this document, number one. The FAA maintains privacy over UAM and the national airspace, period. Number two, there will be some common operating procedures or COPS developed. Now, I'm going to ask this to Mary Caitlin because this COPS, common operating procedures, this is not a term I'm familiar with, like in the regulations. You know, we have CFRs, you know, we have regulations, we have advisory circulars. I never heard of a COP. I mean, other than, you know, the ones walking a beat on the street, but like, what exactly is this thing? What's the, the legal, you know, kind of hook, if you will, for this cop concept? I mean, we're going to have common operating procedures that we're all going to, as an industry, agree on. And so what does that mean if you violate them? Or I, I'm not really sure. So hold one, Mary Caitlin. Let's get to that in a second. They also talk about all different levels of automation. I mean, this I'm not going to go through the whole thing because I outlined it all. It's it's huge. Um, but, you know, what, what we already knew was the initial operations are going to be with a pilot on board. OK, and they're going to be short term hops, like probably what you're seeing with Archer and United, where Archer Aviation has created the midnight. In fact, I think just this past week. They rolled the first off the production line. And the idea is this thing is going to fly people Uber-like style from, you know, downtown Manhattan to uh, Newark Airport. Like, 
that's the vision for this like kind of stage one and they're lay, laying the foundation for that um you know here's a couple other things i want to throw out there before i turn it over to you guys to talk about um we already knew about this idea of a supplemental data service provider that's in use space that's also in utm and, and uas traffic management it's this idea of auxiliary kind of providers like for specialized weather as an example or terrain or obstacle avoidance they're going to plug into this larger federated system that's going to be largely privatized right um but you know there there's also things like demand capacity balancing um and cooperative flow management services i mean lots of terminology here how at the end of the day this is all going to work is going to be really interesting uh like i said 44 pages pages but super dense um and what's honestly to me disappointing is we've changed some words we put some cool diagrams in this document but i don't feel like we're actually closer to doing these operations other than the maybe the archer scenario where and this was a surprise a little bit they said we're going to have them plug into air traffic control okay so there's a path for the, for them but you know for higher le levels of automation um you know how do you deconflict when there's more than just archer out there in newark i i don't know any of those answers and i don't think this document answers it but i, I would love to hear mary caitlin's perspective on that well, I think you're you're absolutely right, Dom, to be pointing out and focusing on what this document is and what it's not. I mean, I think we are still a ways away from you know a, a, a notice of proposed rulemaking on this, or even like an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, which would essentially just be kind of an information collection on the, the part of the FAA in anticipation of of you know rulemaking in the near future. Um, you know, this isn't a regulation. This isn't a guidance document. You know, and we even know, you know, the FAA can't regulate by guidance. That's, um, you know, they can get seriously, they get dinged, you know, by the the IG for things like that. They don't regulate by guidance. But this isn't even an advisory circular. So this isn't guidance. We're, you know, we're still a number of, of levels away from this being um, a regulation or anything that's sort of creating the framework for a regulation. Um, I think it's interesting, you know, you noticed that noted this concept of like the cops, you know, they're they're introducing new terms. Um, you know, the FAA has a number of, of pilot programs that it's running at any given time. And I'm, you know, I don't know the answer to this um, because I'm no longer kind of on the inside um, of the FAA pilot programs like I was um, when I was working on the UAS IPP. Um, but there have been a number of UTM um, and UAM focused pilot programs that the FAA has run over the last few years. and. I know, you know, I would imagine that some of the terms and the the ideas that have evolved, you know, from one where we were at were at 1.0 to where we are at 2.0 may have come out of you know data and ideas and feedback that was collected um, out of those programs. But I, I will be interested to see, um, you know, how, whether and to what extent this is addressed in the upcoming reauthorization because that's where. The rubber will really hit the road. You know that's where Congress will direct the FAA to do something with this conops to initiate a rulemaking. Um, and while it, as we know, we were just talking in Denver about this about the um, the it's a Section Two Two Nine, the uh, infrastructure critical infrastructure designations for UAS flights, it could be years um, before the FAA actually initiates rulemaking, even if it is ordered. You know, in the upcoming re-off by Congress to do so. So. I think I think we're a ways off. I think that the the privatization of the the management is is particularly interesting to me, having lived through a couple of iterations at the FAA where we have actually thought, you know, oh my gosh, we are on the precipice of the possibility of privatizing air traffic control. You know, not just um, not UTM, but actual air traffic control. And there were a lot of constitutional issues um, that were raised in the context of of that. You know, among them, you know, whether um, air traffic management is an inherently governmental function. Um, so I would I would imagine that those types of challenges will come up, you know, when when we're actually at the implementation stage um, for this system. I never would have thought about that, but you know that makes an abundant amount of sense. And you know I'll tell you, and I'd love to get uh, Lindsay's. You know she's really outside of this. Uh, 
uh, community to her thoughts as, as she's listening to this, but um, that, you know, I don't see how these companies can survive Mary Caitlin, like, because if there's so much uncertainty, like if, why would I ever say I'm going to be one of these traffic management companies for eVTOL when we don't even know when that's going to be possible? Well, I mean, well, yeah. Doesn't general UAS traffic management have to be kind of worked out before we could feel safe with urban air mobility and then offloading that to private companies to manage and where do they get their data pool? Are they responsible for their data pool and who certifies that data pool? And I mean, you saw this with like the Lance authorizations. It seemed like there was an entire ecosystem of startups that were just there to authorize drone flights going off. But where's that data coming from that authorizes the flight? The FAA, you know, so what was the value proposition for those companies that they could actually sustain a business? And we saw a lot um, of them shutter, right? They they closed their doors. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, or, or got absorbed into companies where that mm -hmm. tooling is useful for an actual business case. Yep. So um, I just want to clear acronym soup. So <laughs> just in case that helps uh, anybody. UAS, um, unmanned or uncrewed aircraft system. UTM is UAS traffic management. UAM is urban air mobility. The U is not related. AAM is advanced air mobility, which is the entire category of big drones, as we'll call them, not just in urban environments. So, Lindsay, what are your thoughts on urban air mobility just in general? now that you have this alphabet serial in front of you. Yeah, this was a very interesting piece of work that I read. And from my engineering background, we always think about risk and risk assessment. And when I read through this, I'm like, Ooh, there's lots of red flags for me. Yeah. On a risk perspective. <laughs> and Mike, I heard you talk about the value proposition. There's risks to those companies coming in as private operators, potentially on some of these things, because you're right, they're not going to have any data. And when they assess, which they should be doing, the risk from a value and a safety perspective. How are they going to properly gauge this? I feel they're going into something that might be considered a higher risk business for them. And then I was also reading it from the perspective of, you know, we if we are going to proceed here, we need to keep the risk levels very low for our public. These things are operating in urban environments. And I'm like, I didn't see very much wording in here that talked about when we're doing regulatory pieces, really focusing on the risk and the safety and doing everything we can to make sure people are safe. The, and maybe it was buried in there and it's, I'm not as familiar with the terminology, but I would wanna make sure any regulatory governance, anything we're doing about this urban air um, mobility framework is really centered on the risk to our public and making sure everybody's safe that's using these systems and maybe underneath these systems that are up in the air. You know, you raise a great point, Lindsay, and I love your perspective because it really is like almost from just a pure member of the public that doesn't have any other insider background in, into this kind of new technology and, and you know, because we're, we're just so knee deep in it, the three of us. Um, you're right. Safety is inherent in all of this, but I'm looking at my notes here and they're pretty extensive. And I did a lot of copy and pasting and I didn't see the word safety a lot in that document. Now I, and, and I Googled, usually I right tried on the for front it. page. Oh, you too. did? did it, <laughs> right? I did a find safety and I'm... <laughs> Oh my God. That, you know, think about that. And it's usually, usually the only thing we talk about, right? It's Dawn, safety. When, it's when safety. These things right. Yeah. And, and it's all, it's inherent in everything they're talking about in here. But you're right. A document like this that is aspirational, that is like, this is what this is going to be and how it's going to work. And to not include the word safety in it one time. Uh, wow. That was, that was a big miss. And, and but, honestly, thank you for pointing that out because you are, like I said, you're, you're coming at this from, not only an engineering perspective, but just as a member, pure member of the public saying like, wow, um, I'm kind of concerned, like, how are you going to protect me uh, as I'm walking on the street underneath this thing flying over me or in a commercial aircraft that's sharing this cooperative airspace, uh, you know, with the, with the same vehicle. So uh, good on you. Great, great point right there. Dawn, I think all of this, every point that everybody brought up speaks to how conceptual this specific part of the automated systems industry is still. Yeah. 
right? Because if they felt that they had enough certitude to put in safety requirements here, I'm sure they would have, right? At least to plant the seeds for later discussions as there's, you know, it moves on later in the process. Um, any insights on that, Mary Caitlin, before we climb, kind of close out? You know, I think that will be the, the key, right? It, it are going to be, what are the airworthiness criteria, you know, for the aircraft, but then, you, and that's only part of the equation, right? And I think we've made, um, you know, we've made progress in that space. You know, we've seen special airworthiness criteria issued for a number of manufacturers in the federal register, um, kind of as they're moving through the type certi certification process, which is, is great. That's fantastic. What needs to come next are going to be the operational um, regulations. And, and I think that's where we'll really start to see more focus on, on safe operations because it's going to affect, you know, everyone that's, that's sharing the airspace. Um, so I'm, I'm also, thank you, Lindsay, for pointing that out. I'm surprised sort of at the lack of um, references to, to safety there. Um, I know, you know, the FAA safety record is hard won. So I know that that was um, top of mind while they were writing it, but it didn't come out that way. Well, and frankly, they're putting in assumptions in this document, then that should be one of the assumptions that like everything in here is like hinges on safety. Uh, that would have been like one sentence and that would have been the critical sentence. Yeah, I, I, but like I said, I think we still got a lot of time, to be honest. I, I think all the companies that are engaging in this space actually finally understand that too, right? Because if you look back when Uber thought they were going to do their thing, like that was completely almost harebrained. But I mean, to their credit, they did move people forward and say, okay, maybe this is possible, or maybe there there's at least a base level of technology that might make this a worthy pursuit. And a lot of the companies that engage now are traditional aviation or add ties to traditional aviation and understand like, this is not going to be a five-year turnaround. This could be a decade. And it's going to be, if you own it, if you own even a piece of it, it's going to be very valuable. So anyway, we, we have to close out the show. Thank you so much. We had some great perspectives here today. Thank our guests. Lindsay and Mary Caitlin. Thank you, Jason, for participating in the, uh, in the chat. And thank you all of the other viewers who are out there today. Also want to thank our sponsors, Fixar, SAIC, Rupert Law, and DroneUp for making this show possible. We appreciate what they do for us. Dom, we've got some great stuff coming up uh, in the next week or so. You want to talk about it? We sure do. So we've got Doodle Labs on the Donna Drones on Wednesday. They're a blue UAS component. Uh, maker. They make this really cool six band uh, helix uh, mesh rider radio. So check that out at 9 a.m. Mountain Time. And then Thursday, we've got Sean Gare. He's with the Energy Drone and Robotics Coalition. And he'll be talking about what's happening with robots and drones in the energy sector on Thursday in our clubhouse, 11 a.m. Uh, Mountain Time. So be sure to join Drone and uh, Sean uh, for that. And then um, you know, they're having a big seventh annual summit in Houston, Texas in June. Uh, so mark your calendars now. We've got a Law Tech Connect Energy Edition. Mary Caitlin and some of her colleagues are going to be a part of that. Also sponsors of that uh, program. So please join us in Houston. I've got free passes. DM me. If you're listening to me, no, no strings attached. And uh, let's see. Next week, Instead of doing our full tilt, we are going to be live from the Commercial UAV Congress in Washington, D.C., noon uh, Eastern time, 10 a.m. Mountain. So check that out. So great, great stuff coming up, Mike. All right. Uh, and we are out here. <laughs>